definition is. With micro, you can just reshuffle the genes. Think of it as shuffling a deck of cards and rearranging the deck. You give out a new hand every time, and you can get something slightly different, but you're still dealing from the same deck. Now, you're not going to get an Uno card out of an old made deck, you see, unless a new card is created, and that's what evolution demands for the origin of a new species. And that's what we don't see. And so that's where I draw the line. Yeah. And yes. your perspective is that the deity, at some point in the past, created these two different decks. Two different what? Decks. The old maid. Uh, oh, 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 yes, yes. Okay, you're going back to the analogy. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, like, like the lizard deck and the bird deck, and that birds did not evolve from dinosaurs. Yeah. Okay, now, of course, I'm not in a spot to be able to even ask good questions about that. So I'm coming from, You're a, doing it. from a perspective of uh, the book of Genesis. Is microevolution simply saying that creation is continuing, that it's going on? Oh, no. No, microevolution is, is merely the uh, genetic drift. Uh, like I said, reshuffling, recombination. It's reason why uh, you may look a little like your cousin, even, uh, even more than you do look like your brother. It's, uh, it's taking that deck and reshuffling a new hand out to the next that's generation. Still, that's still the human deck, as far as you're concerned. Sure. Like a yes, you've got to get new cards created somehow by an undirected process uh, for evolution to proceed. You must get new genes with new genetic information and new DNA that actually works in order to originate a new species. Now, you can say that two species got separated from each other and they couldn't breed anymore, kind of like the Chihuahua and the, the timber wolf can't breed anymore for obvious reasons, but they're still Canis. They're still Canidae, and really, since they are interfertile genetically, they're the same species by the old definition of species and by the, uh, the creationary definition of species, those are uh, just, uh, uh, you, know, you can have little teeny poodles, and you can have those wolf-sized poodles, too. Uh, they're still Canis. You can call them Canis familiaris, you can call them Canis lupus, but it's Canis. Within the creation spectrum, is there some anticipation or fear or dislike of having an ancestry that might have come from a different creature? The Homo erectus and others, which you refer to as... Uh, Extinct monkeys. Now that's where the creationists have to stop fooling themselves. We shouldn't be looking for nothing because we have a like or a dislike or because we have a favorite theory or because we're going to get endowed chairmanships or tenure or approval of other people. Science, like religion, had better be a search for the truth or you're a hypocrite. That's how I feel about that. Now let's, now let's go to Mr. Abby, now, you've heard my questions. I've come from an absolute novice when it comes to DNA and, and both of your backgrounds. But I come from a faith tradition, and I am not bothered by the separate decks that may eventually have evolved into human, human beings. I do not see that as something which violates my faith and my understanding. Uh, I really have some difficulty with uh, accepting the second chapter of Genesis as literal when... Uh, uh, the female is supposed to have been created out of the rib of the male. I just don't see that as being scientifically defensible. But Abby, my question to you is, if, if you can remember what I asked, because I don't think I can repeat it. Uh, if you understood what I was asking, is there something to be perhaps disliked about coming from uh, an earlier species which was not truly human, but now we have defined as humans at the top of the scale? Is there something inherently bad about that? Can I go back to your, the question you asked before that about how is microevolution a continuation of creation? Um, I would think from a theistic evolutionary perspective that a retrovirus, a part of a retrovirus being used to create mammals that would one day become species that we see today, I would think that is really cool. That is a cool idea. But I really like viruses, so I'm a little biased. Um, so I think the kind of continuing creation that we see is even more phenomenal than the original creation. Like, it just keeps going. That's cool. Um, but about uh, the question you asked, I don't have a problem. I really, personally, um, just from a scientist perspective, I have difficulty doing research on primates. We have to. To, for HIV research, it's the only way we can do clinical trials on HIV vaccines. But personally, um, the relationship I think we have with them and their higher order 
is thinking. It really does bother me that, that we have to do this kind of research. Um, but then again, you know, just from our perspective, we try to limit suffering and that sort of thing, make sure we can get the most good information out of those kinds of studies as we can. Okay, I don't know why it's not on, but the, oh, there we go, okay. Questions for Abby? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I appreciate your attempt to actually further the discussion by engaging responses you've seen, uh, like in the creation of this response thing. Uh, I attended the Pemsky Bruce debate a few weeks ago, and that did not happen. It was, it was terrible because they, they did not attempt to advance the conversation by, by anticipating the other guy's responses that they'd seen before. So it was like we were back at Spare One 20 years ago. So anyway, that's, I, I appreciate that. I wish we saw more of that. You said that uh, uh, we share mistakes with other organisms, and uh, these mistakes do not make sense in any other paradigm. Uh, if I could just paint a really brief picture for you. Imagine an omnipotent God who creates all the life uh, on the earth, and uh, not necessarily exactly as we see it today, but fairly similar, sort of. And, uh, and then sin enters the world uh, through the fall of man. And sin has a very deleterious effect on all sorts of things, not just on morality and, and, uh, and actions and such, but also on the world as we see it. We see uh, you know, all, the, all the bad stuff that happens, and including on the genetic code as well. So the reason you came here was to provide a molecular genetic case or whatever against, against creationism and for evolution. Uh, why do these mistakes rule out creationism necessarily when they can very easily be explained by the idea of a Christian God who created the world more or less as we see it, but then had sent into the world to screw stuff up? I absolutely agree, except for the specificity of the mistakes we see. So again, to go back to my little Lego uh, analogy, pretend uh, the little girl was playing with her Legos and her dog came by and chewed up one of her little yellow blocks. Well, it, was still, it still worked, it's still fine, so she puts it in her cap. But then she goes to all her yellow blocks and has her dog chew those pieces exactly the same way and puts that in her spaceship and puts that in her dinosaur. Um, to see very specific mutations that happen the same way in us and primates and other organisms, I don't think that would make as much sense as common descent. Given that the uh, Christian doctrine includes a God who has ordained everything that comes to pass, uh, and therefore is in control of every of every event that ever occurs in the planet and the universe, including on the molecular microscopic level. Again, why would that explanation make more sense than a God who directed it that way? Since you since you're trying to disprove creationism, you know, so far without without a good rebuttal to this, they're at least on the same level. Well, I would just say if your God went, if your God went to that much trouble to leave a trail of breadcrumbs that would lead us to a conclusion. It's false. Um, that's kind of sneaky. And, and I don't see a particular goal in doing that. But then again, your God is infinite. So it, there might be something down the road that all these mistakes totally make sense. Um, but right now, that's what they, they show us. Can you please explain why the fact that your inability to see the goal or the reason for the breadcrumb trail means that it didn't actually happen that way? Oh, it doesn't at all. There could absolutely be a reason for those mistakes and trickster, some sort of trickster god, but we can't really make those assumptions in science. We have to look at those genes, say, you know, they've kind of got these same mistakes in the exact same location. To us, it makes sense that they were, they were descended from a common ancestor. That's all we can say. We can't go into a lab and be like, well, God's going to cure AIDS and go, you know it, you do it, you do it. Of course, nobody's saying that. Uh, just final question. Um, uh, this, I guess, is would you would you say that this is because you are uh, you are invested and one hundred percent committed to a naturalistic worldview uh, a priori before you come into the lab? Oh, well, I'm not on docking scale. Um, I'm at the same location he is, six point nine nine nine. Scientists, we are absolutely slaves to evidence. If you give us evidence, we have to believe it or we fight tooth and nail to disprove it, and then we get to be the head honchos in the field, and it feels really good. So if there is um, an inherent flaw in evolution, then it should be one of my main goals to overthrow it, because that's how I get a paper in science. That's how I get a paper in nature. Um, Thank you.